Kalispera sas, good evening, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this first lecture for 2018 and the first lecture for the 49th le public lecture series of the Archaeological Research Unit. I wish you all a happy new year. It's still January, so we can still wish a happy new year. I hope it's a productive and peaceful and happy one for everyone. Um, the program for this lecture series will circulate soon. Uh, this year, with the help of Haris Paraskeva, our postdoctoral fellow, it will, it, it will get a facelift, so it will be a nicer looking, much nicer looking uh, program. Um, we had one, uh, uh, we're waiting for w one for next week to see whether we will have a lecture or not. We were planning to show the Pendadactylos documentary, but the rector snatched it and he will show it in the Central <laughs> University. So this will be later on in February. Uh, but our program will circulate soon. And with this opportunity, I would like also to tell you that on the 10th of February, on Saturday, we will have the workshop for the Archaeological Research Unit, the, the yearly workshop on the um, work of the University of Cyprus in archaeology for 2017. So you're all welcome to come. Again, the program will circulate in the next couple of days. But now uh, I would like to welcome to the Archaeological Research Unit our speaker, Dr. Charlene uh, Vela, who has come to Cyprus from Malta uh, and has kindly accepted to give a, uh, us a lecture here about her research. Dr. Vela has obtained her PhD from the University of Warwick in 2016. Her doctoral research was on the followers of Antonello da Messina, was carried out under the tutelage of Dr. Donald Cooper from the University of Cambridge. She's now a lecturer in the Department of History of Art at the University of Malta. She has published a number of books, The Mediterranean Artistic Context of Late Medieval Malta, as well and two of them we have here, so this is the one that I just told you about, which she has donated to the library, and this is the second one which she, she has edited, so those of you who are interested, you will be able to have a look at these wonderful publications in our library. Um, and this is the edited volume uh, uh, with essays entitled At Home in Art, Essays in Honor of Mario Buhagiar. She has also published numerous articles and papers on medieval art and is art critic and reviewer on art books to the Sunday Times of Malta since January 2008. Furthermore, she has served on the executive committee of the Malta Historical Society. The title of her lecture to this evening is Malta in 1530 and the Hospitalier Legacy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here today. This is the title of my lecture today, Malta in 1530 and the Hospitaller Legacy. It will deal with Malta just before the arrival of the Knights of St. John in 1530 and the repercussions thereafter as soon as the Knights settled on the island. 1530 is certainly a benchmark date in Malta's artistic, economic, social, and religious history. This is the year that the Hospitaller Order of the Knights of St. John, headed by the master Jean Vieux de Lille Adam, settled on the Maltese island. They were there until 1798. But the Knights did not come to a desert island. There were villages dotting the countryside and the local gentry residing in Imdina, or the Civitas, as it was then known, the main city of the islands and its suburb of Rabat were quite well populated. The other two main nuclei of the late, of late medieval Malta were the citadel of Gozo. This is a map that is upside down, published in 1536, and the castle on Gozo, as well as the Castrum Maris, or the castle by the sea in Birgu on the Grand Harbour, which was the only populated area of the Grand Harbour of Malta. And this is the first ever published map of the islands by Jean Quintan, 
Dautin. He was a Frenchman who resided in Malta between 1530 and 1536, and he served the order as chaplain of the French knights and auditor to the Grand Master. This is an impression of Imdina as it is portrayed in 16th century frescoes in the Grand Master's palace in Valletta. It focuses on Imdina. This is little, a little detail of what we know about Imdina, late medieval Imdina, because so much has changed since then. Since then. So we have the Civitas, the Gozo Castello, and the Castrumaris that housed the civil and ecclesiastical administration. There were merchants, craftsmen, artisans, lawyers, notaries, doctors. It is where Latin was spoken. These people commissioned sophisticated works of art that were imported from Catalonia, Venice, and especially Sicily. So what were the Maltese islands like just before 1530? Malta's population in 1530 was essentially Christian, but many islanders were very insular and spoke only Maltese, which is pretty much a Semitic language that harks back to Malta's Muslim past. In 1530, the Maltese islands were not entirely the cultural and artistic backwater that Jean Quintin d'Autan his bleak reports on the islands published in 1536 would lead us to believe. As on roads, the hospital, the hospitalers eventually built up a flourishing harbor economy and a major capital city, Valletta. This is an artist's impression of Imdina based on archival knowledge, plans, images that survive and the like. In 1530, the Renaissance in Italy was giving way to mannerism. The Renaissance was a cultural movement that changed the way man saw himself in the universe. Malta had a series of Italian Renaissance sculptures and paintings that were commissioned for the islands before 1530. They were mainly destined for Malta's main cathedral in Imdina and churches in its suburb, Rabat. This is one of them. 1474, that is 56 years before the arrival of the Knights of St. John to Malta, may be the date in which Malta first came into contact with the Renaissance. It's through this freestanding white holy water stoop, executed in a classical manner by Domenico Caggini, who had his sculptural workshop in Palermo in Sicily. It was destined for Imdina's Cathedral. The basin has a decoration of very fine reading, suggesting knowledge of Roman prototypes. It has an ornate, it is an ornate white marble basin that rises from a corolla of fleshy vegetal, vegetal motifs, and there is Saint Paul bearing a sword athwart his shoulder. Domenico Cagini established himself in Palermo in 1458. His workshop grew to become one of the largest workshops in Renaissance Sicily. Upon his death, the workshop was passed on to his son, Antonello. He was still very young, and several works were commissioned posthumously after Domenico's death. Domenico gravitated early in life to Florence, where he became associated with Brunelleschi and also came into contact with Lorenzo Ghiberti. Gagini, together with Francesco Laurana, was instrumental in introducing the Renaissance idiom to Naples and to Sicily, and through there also to Malta. The Gagini workshop was very busy after Domenico's death, producing marvelous marble works on designs by the master, such as this, a 1496 baptismal font for Malta's cathedral. Domenico's workshop that was inherited by his son Antonello, as you can see, was still very productive. Antonello was only 14 years old when this workshop production was produced. A successful work. Its main interest lies in the stand with the four youths that carry the load of the baptismal basin. It carries two low relief medallions, one with a sword bearing Saint Paul, the patron saint of the islands of Malta, and the other a baptism of Christ. And then on the 23rd of February, 1504, Antonello Gagini was 26 years old and he receives another commission for a Maltese church. 
Antonello Gagini produces this virgin and child for the Franciscan Church of Santa Maria di Gesù for the church for the church of Rabat just outside Imdina. Again, an essentially Renaissance work with a classicizing sobriety, plastic handling of the medium. The voluminous drapery folds are also very revealing. This is a sculptor who later on went on to work with Michelangelo on the tomb of Julius II in San Pietro a Vincoli. Molto also had a close connection with the nephews of the great Renaissance Sicilian master Antonello da Messina, who died in 1479. In 1505, the nuns from the convent of St. Peter in Imdina entered into a contractual agreement with Salvo d'Antonio, Antonello's nephew, to produce a polyptic and altarpiece for their church. It was to have a central Madonna del Soccorso, a crowning Golgotha, and Annunciation scene, each to be flanked by two paintings on either side, and this predella panel that survives in the Imdina Cathedral Museum. It portrays Christ as the Salvator Mundi with the apostles on either side. It bears an inscription, the legend Salvo d'Antonius Messanensis me pincit 1510. This is Christ the Salvator Mundi flanked by Saint Paul and Saint Peter on either side. This is arguably Malta's finest Renaissance painting, and it is heavily indebted to Antonello da Messina, especially the Salvatore Mundi in the National Gallery of London. You can notice that the apostles and Christ are each individualized. They are expressively articulate. They have a certain sculptural grandeur that gives them almost a miniaturistic dimension that we associate with Flemish art. Salvo d'Antonio was undoubtedly Antonello's most talented nephew. But there is another nephew by, of Antonello da Messina who, who executed works for Maltese patrons, Salvo's cousin Antonio de Saliba. He was in fact Antonello's most prolific nephew who ran a busy workshop between 1495 and 1535, after having spent some 15 years working in Venice, where he was also associated with the workshop of Giovanni Bellini. Antonio's patrons included, among many others, the Franciscan minor observants we've already mentioned, who had just built their church outside the walls of the Civitas. This virgin and child was part of a larger complex to portrays the Madonna enthroned with the child angels surrounding them. The child wears a coral pendant and coral bracelets. The coral pendant was given to children to ward off evil. There is a goldfinch, that's a symbol of Christ's passion, that ties in with the iconography of the painting that was to be situated above this, the deposition of Christ. A painting that betrays late Gothic idiosyncrasies, especially in the elongation of the figure of Christ. The altarpiece was an ambitious painting that was completed in 1515. It consisted of at least 11 or 15 different panels. This is a hypothetical reconstruction that is also based on a 1730 account of the polyptic before it was dismembered and dispersed. It helps us understand what the polyptic looked like. It was certainly an impressive work, one that testified to the informed patronage of the orders, in this case, the Franciscan Friars of Malta. Another Renaissance Sicilian work to survive in Malta is this Madonna adoring the child that is very much connected compositionally to Giovanni Bellini. It is today in the parish museum of the town of Zeytun in Malta. It carries the signature of a hospitaller knight Fra Pedro Núñez de Villavicencio, and the date 1672. Villavicencio was a distinguished Baroque painter from Seville who had been trained with Murillo. In Malta, he was greatly influenced by Mattia Preti. Why is there his signature on the painting? Well, the painting had quite uh, a turbulent past. It was attacked in a raid, and it was given to this painter knight to restore and he overpainted much of it. This painting was restored in the last few years. The signature was kept as part of the painting's history. But it is actually a Renaissance work that past art historians believe to be a copy of a lost 
Renaissance original, but this is in fact the original painting. Another significant sculpture then by Antonello Cagini for Malta. Oops, a second, I'm playing hide and seek. Another significant sculpture by Antonello Cagini for Malta was commissioned in 1535, that is five years after the arrival of the Hospitallers. It was the new Grand Master Fra Simone Bonanno who commissioned from Cagini in Palermo a sepulchral monument for the late Master Lila Dam, who died on the 21st of August 1534 in the Franciscan Observant Convent in Ravat that we have again already mentioned. Here we see a full length figure of the Grand Master in the repose of death. His head rests on two cushions that are richly embroidered with leaves and pomegranates, a bravura of technical dexterity. He wears the Grand Master's beretta and ceremonial robes, while his hands are folded on his chest and there is a helmet at his feet. This is one of the last important works by Antonello Cagini. And the fact that he received a commission from the highest of the members of the Order of St. John for such a prestigious funerary monument is ample testimony to the good reputation that this sculptor had in the central Mediterranean. It is now in the crypt of St. John's Cathedral in Valletta, but it was originally commissioned to be placed in the church of the Castrum Maris, today's Fort St. Angelo, in Birgu. That's a detail of the Grand Master with a chipped nose, mo nose and beard. Grand Master Liladam was master to the Hospitalis from 1521 until 1534. He was a Frenchman from the Lang of France and a key personality to the artistic history of the Maltese Islands. It was he who brought to the knights to Malta after their seven year exile after having left Rhodes in 1522. The knights sailed away from their beloved Rhodes on the 1st of January, 1523. It had been their home for over 200 years. They were traumatized. Their most valuable possessions were placed on this great ship, the Gran Caracca di Rodi or the Caracca Sant'Anna. It was commissioned by Lilla Dam in Nice in 1522 and it was the most fearsome war machine of its time. It weighed more than 2,000 tons. It had spacious council chambers and dormitories, and most importantly, it had an extremely spacious chapel. In this chapel was an over two meter high St. John the Baptist that survives in St. John's Cathedral in Valletta. The Knights realized that this is an important work of art and they kept on worshipping it as a sacred relic for generations. It was a precious reminder of the ship that brought them to Malta. The Gran Caracas Chapel had a relief carving as an altarpiece, portraying Saint Anne, the Virgin and the Christ Child. It's identified with this work of art, an oval polychrome wood medallion that was cut into this oval shape in around 1729, it was originally in a square format. The knights, on having left Rhodes, were accompanied by three other galleys, as well as many other vessels, on which were also those residents of Rhodes who did not want to continue living under the Ottomans. They accompanied the knights until they found themselves a new base, Malta. But it was on this Gran Caracca that the Hospitaller's treasure was placed for the long and arduous journey. There were some astounding works of art. Among them, a nativity scene by Albrecht Dürer, fine sets of trap tapestries that were commissioned in Flanders and France, Byzantine icons, liturgical vestments, their personal armor and weapons, their archives, that survive as well, a treasure of relics and reliquaries that made them the envy of Christian Europe, among which was the right arm of Saint John the Baptist, their ba patron saint. These works of art had made Rhodes one of the greatest wonders of the late medieval world. In the following years, the Hospitallers and their followers moved to Messina, Viterbo, 
Vifrange and Nice. They were at first geared towards regaining Rhodes back. But only, it was only in 1530 that, th that they did accept the arrangement with Emperor Charles V to inhabit Malta and defend the castle of Tripoli. Before accepting this gift, Liladam sent commission to the Maltese Islands in 1524 to report on the islands. Details from this bleak <coughs> report were published by Giacomo Bosio, who wrote the history of the order. Malta was much smaller and flatter than Rhodes. It was far out at sea. It had almost no wood left. Like Jean Quintin's 1536 published description, this was a rather bleak report. Malta had a magnificent harbor, however, a population of some 10 to 20,000 people and a cotton production of considerable value. And as, as we've seen, there was also a local gentry that had an informed patronage it was all, that was also directed to the Umdina Cathedral. Liladam and the Hospitallers arrived on Malta on the morning of 26 October 1530, and they soon set up the seat of the convent at Burgu Peninsula in the Grand Harbour. This was the only part of the Grand Harbour that had been previously inhabited. Across from it was the barren Shebaraz Peninsula that would later become Valletta. Burgo had previously had its own castellan who lived in the palace in the Castrum Maris and who was in charge of Burgo, the suburb, that consisted of an impoverished fishing village. The hospitalers could have installed themselves in the old city of Indina, where the Maltese gentry resided in their grand palaces and where there was the town council, the cathedral and the clergy. However, the hospitalers felt compelled to defend the grand harbour and thus they occupied the port and the castle of Birgo, the Castrum Maris. After all, they were a naval order and they needed to be by the sea. And thus the knights took over the Castrum Maris, which had been built by the Normans or by the Swabians, refortified by the Angevins and also by the Aragonese. So in 1530, Birgo became the first capital city of Malta. The castle had its churches as did its suburb. There was a church in the suburb dedicated to St. Lawrence, San Lorenzo, and Mare. It had only recently been rebuilt, and Lilladam took over this church to make it the order's new conventual church. Lilladam also asked for a report from his trusted military engineer, Fra Diego de Perez de Malfrer, to oversee the modernization and restoration of the existing fortifications. And he talks about the Castrum Maris. Some years ago, he says, the Castrum was all disfigured and falling into ruins. Today, however, adding to its natural defensive and precipitous, precipitous position, it is also being fortified, fortified with an unremitting effort that if that is kept up, it will be in the near future impregnable and it will not fail fall to any enemy. Inside resides the most illustrious master of the Order of Jerusalem. At the foot of the fort there is a hamlet. Today, on account of its population and walls, it may be called a town, completely erected on a hillock, or rather dug into it. Together with the fort, on the right and on the left, it is washed by the sea, coming into the harbour which has surrounding and curving shores. And he also gives us an account of the suburb of Burgu. He describes it as a wretched place where the houses are dug into the rock. The place is exposed to all the winds. The houses are breached and falling into ruins with walls crumbling and unfinished on weak foundations. They are buildings without attics, parapet walls. The roofs roughly made are covered, covered either with tiles or reeds, frightening indeed. These are terrible conditions, certainly not conditions that were fitting for the order, for people who belonged to the richest of nobles of Europe. Among the first works that were commissioned were on the fortifications of Burgu. 
Birger was enclosed within a wall and flanked by a small bastion to secure it against any attack. Other urgent works were carried out on the Castellan's late medieval palace. It was reconfigured to suit Lilla Dam's needs. This is Birgo today. It is now a large town with winding and unorderly streets that certainly follow the pattern of the medieval settlement. The knights took over existing structures, making amendments and erecting new buildings. Anthony Luttrell's research has established that the auberges in which the knights lived in the suburb of the Castrum Maris were not really auberges at all, but houses that were built by knights who could afford to build in be live in better luxury than the rest of the community. The three to 4,000 Rodiot community that followed the knights in their peregrinations from 1522 was diverse and consisted of both Latins and Greeks. An important Rodiot was Fra Diego de Perez de Malfrier. Malfrier's designation as Soprastante delle Opere, coupled with the fact that he was a professed knight, seems to suggest an official function as director of works and head of l'Officio delle Case, the planning directorate of the knights. His chief moratore or capo mastro was Niccolò Flavari, a Rodiot who had accompanied the hospitallers from Rhodes, leaving his wife and children behind. Savari was the first important architect of the hospitalers in Malta in these early years. This is what remains of the 16th century walls of Fort St. Angelo. This is the only bastion wall built during the magistracy of Lille Adam, which Jean Quintan mentioned in his 1536 description. It is the oldest part that survives of the fortifications. It was constructed under the supervision of Malfrère, it is not deeply sloping, it is rather like medieval bastions, perpendicular. What makes it significant is that it still contains the arms of the first four masters that ruled over Malta. These are the armorial shields that survive on these fortifications. Once in Malta, Liladam proved to be a cultured man and a great patron of the arts. Although he seems to have been rather conservative in the architecture that he commissioned. Although Malta had its own connections with Renaissance workshops, the first works commissioned by the hospitallers betray Gothic idiosyncrasies rather than Renaissance. When it comes to architecture, this may have been because Lille Adam was nostalgic of the island that was once the hospitallers' home, Rhodes. Among the most important buildings that the Grand Master commissioned for Bilgo was the hospital, or the Sacra Infermeria. It is today a monastery for cloistered nuns, the monastery of Santa Scholastica, with its church dedicated to Saint Anne that was rebuilt in 1679, but which luckily retains some of its original elements. It is difficult to get into, but you can see from this drawing that it was built in a sober Gothic idiom that can be called Hospitaller Gothic. This is the earliest architectural language that the Knights introduced to Malta with quadripartite vaults. Apart from the Sacra Infermeria, Lilla Dam also commissioned an outdoor covered staircase for the Master's Palace in the Castrum Maris and accretions to the Castrum Maris's own church which became his private chapel. He also commissioned the, man, the Magna Corte Castellania, which is now the Inquisitor's Palace. And in 1532, a new conventual church for Birgu, the conventual city, because the previous church was burnt down by fire in 1532. This is the church in the Castrum Maris, a church that was mentioned in a 1280 document as the Ecclesia Santa Maria and which mariners used as one of their landmarks when sailing through the Mediterranean Sea. It consists of pointed diaphragm arches with groin vaults, which is probably Siculo Norman. Leladam used this as his private church and he asked for it to be extended on three sides. The extension similarly has a groin vault. You can
can see the extension to the right side and there's an extension to the apse as well as to the west front and that is where Lil Adam himself was buried. This is the exterior of the church. This is an addition by the knights and this is the Castellan's house that Grand Master Lil Adam took over. So who was the architect here? We do not know. There are no records. Was it Niccolo Flavari? Was it Malfrer? Or was it the architect and military engineer Antonio Ferramolino, who was in Malta between 1535 and 1541? We just do not know. But these are the works that the knights commissioned for Birgu. This is the Magna Corte Castellania, the high legal seat where the jurisdiction of the order was practiced. The courtyard has survived, and it preserves aspects of this hospitaler Gothic modest scale, austere monastic sobriety. The style is the same one that had given Rhodes a distinctive architectural flavor. And its repeat on Malta must have been a natural preoccupation for the hospitalers. It too makes use of the quadripartite or rib vault. Whoever the architect, he presumably received his brief from the Grand Master himself, Lil Adam. One would expect that the Knights would commission a Renaissance or Mannerist architecture, a style that is more current in nearby Italy. But instead, the style harks back to Rhodes and even as far back to Krag the Chevalier in Syria. The hospitalers that had rebuilt the castle in Syria using the same architectural language. And that was back in 1142 a castle that is testimony to the great military prestige that the knights had acquired in their early history, where they distinguished themselves by their fortifications. From Crack the Chevalier to Rhodes and then to Valletta, the hospitalers built some of the mightiest fortifications. Lil Adam extended his architectural patronage elsewhere on the islands. Lil Adam further popularized the Gothic vault when he commissioned at his own expense to rebuild the convent and cloister of the Church of the Franciscan Minor Observance at Rabat, that is located just outside the walls of the city of Imdina. It is there that he retired when he wanted a little peace from his duties, and there he had a cell where he also died in 1534. These were new commissions by the order, but there were several works of art that had made it to Malta from Rhodes. Some of the items that had made it to Malta serve as an indicator of the knight's artistic sophistication. Unfortunately, several other treasures were lost in the 1532 fire in the church of San Lorenzo. This is one of the works that had made it to Malta from Rhodes, but is, which is no longer in Malta today, the Madonna of Philermos. During their long stay of over 200 years on Rhodes, the knights came into close contact with Byzantine art. They acquired a rich collection of holy icons, some of which made it to Malta, just like this one. Among the Byzantine works of art that the hospitalers had venerated on Rhodes was this miracle-working Madonna that had been revered by the Greek Christians even before the hospitalers had arrived on the island. It got its name from Mount Philermos on Rhodes, where it was worshipped. It was piously believed to have been painted by Saint Luke and brought to Rhodes from Jerusalem in about the year 1000. It was known across the Aegean as a miracle-working image, and the hospitalers believed it to have been instrumental in the victory of the 1480 Battle of Rhodes. The Siege of Malta of 1565, too, was firmly believed by Grand Master de Vallette and by the Knights to have been achieved through the intercession of this Madonna. The icon had miraculously ex escaped damage when there was that 1532 fire in the church of San Lorenzo. This is the painting without its risa. What we see is a tiny fragment of what was probably originally a larger painting that portrays a Greek Byzantine icon 
of considerable artistic interest. It was probably produced in Constantinople for the imperial family, and it had somehow found its way to Rhodes after the fall of Constantinople. After the building of Valletta, the icon was transferred from Birgu, first to the Church of Our Lady of Victories in Valletta, and subsequently to the conventual church of St. George, where a chapel had been prepared specifically to receive it. After the Napoleonic conquest of Malta in 1798, it was one of the few treasures that Grand Master Ferdinand Don von Hompesch was permitted to take out of the island. After the resignation of Hompesch, it was presented to Tsar Paul I, who had been elected Grand Master by a few rebel knights. It had a turbulent past, was considered to be lost for decades, and it is now associated with this painting discovered in 1997. There were other icons that were brought to Malta by the Rodiots, who accompanied the knights. This is one housed in the Greek Orthodox Church in Valletta, a large virgin of Damascus, a, an icon that was very, was very much connected with an aristocratic Rodiot family, the Calamia family, who also found their way to Malta. This icon was first worshipped in Birgu, as well in the church dedicated to St. Catherine, and later moved, moved to Valletta when the Greek church had been completed. Another exceptionally fine icon, outstanding for the human poignancy displayed between mother and child, Annalusa, Madonna Merciful Virgin. It comes from the same artistic milieu as the Madonna of Vladimir in Moscow. This is another icon today in Malta and St. John's Cathedral Museum, the Hodigitria Madonna. It's of unknown provenance, but we have reason to believe that this icon was brought to Malta by the Italian knights from Rhodes. The Madonna points to the blessing Christ, who she holds in her arms as the way to salvation. The two figures are isolated against a revulgent gold, gold background. The icon is con of considerable artistic merit and is notable for its linear delicacy and brightness of color, but it has unfortunately been badly restored. Among the other works of art that may have reached Malta with the knights from Rhodes is this painting in St. John's Museum, a triptych of the lamentation over the dead Christ. A late 18th century source claims that it came from Rhodes it is believed to have been the altarpiece of a chapel on board one of the galleys of the knights, but direct evidence is lacking. It is a work of significant accomplishment which has been attributed to the immediate circle of Jan van Skorel. On the central panel we have the virgin who presses against her face the lifeless corpse of her son, Christ. Mary Magdalene wipes away a tear. Saint John wrings his hand in grief. As a young man, Van Skorel had established contacts with the Knights of the Order of St. John when in 1519, he stopped at Rhodes on his way to the Holy Land on pilgrimage. So there might be a close connection there. And it is also possible that Caravaggio, who saw this painting during his stay in Malta, was inspired both by the poignant formal simplification of this Golgotha story and and this inspired him for his own great painting of the raising of Lazarus, painting that he executed in 1609 and which survives in Messina in Sicily. There are two great Caravaggio paintings in St. John's Cathedral. And there are other works of art that are associated with this early period of the Knights of St. John. This is a portable altar a tafel portatile, composed of wood and red marble, around which is a remarkable frieze of alternating miniatures under small pieces of rock crystal and lucid enamels. A delicate frieze of chased silver bearing an acanthus leaf decoration runs along the portatile's edge, while an another enameled frieze with dragons runs along the inside. 
It is believed to have once been in use in a chapel of one of the galleys of the order. Furthermore, it is not believed to presently be in its complete state. Moreover, the images do not seem to be placed in a logical sequence either. While the miniatures must be Venetian because of the Byzantine tradition with which they were executed, the enamels, on the other hand, seem to point to an Italian source. The combination of these two styles can be explained by the fact that Venice was a melting pot of cultures. And as Charlotte van der Hayden has analyzed, Venice might be the most likely place of origin for the Staffel Portatile. Another artifact is a Byzantine reliquary, also called a Hagiotecum, a diptych that belonged to the order from the mid 14th century, recorded on Malta at least since the 18th century. Whether it reached Malta with the Hospitallers in 1530 is not known, but it is still a likely possibility. The exterior of this box-like diptych is covered in red velvet and emblazoned with five enamel shields. Four of the shields bear the emblem of the Hospitallers before the order came to Malta, and the fifth, the arms of a Grand Master, the Villeneuve, the first Grand Master of the Knights who was elected after the order had established itself on roads. The metalwork of the mounts is consistent with a 14th century date, and so it would seem safe to assume that the diptych attained its present form during the period that Villeneuve was master. This is the interior of this diptych. It contains 25 low-relief Byzantine reliefs of varying colors the darkest is the crucifixion on the left, which may be made from Hamite. This is a black and white photo of this image. Silver strips cover the thin wooden frames that hold the reliefs together. There are relics on the far left, third from top, protected by a sheet of mica. Two reliefs are missing, but the other surviving ones all carry a Greek inscription. Most of the reliefs carry a half-length saint, but there are some five in full length. These seem to be produced by two different workshops. And there is a hypothesis that some of these works of art were actually produced here in Cyprus before the order went to Rhodes. The Knights also commissioned works of art when they settled on Malta, before the 1532 fire, as well as afterwards to replace works of art that had been obliterated by the fire. This is a silver chalice. It is a rare surviving example of a 1530-1531 Parisian precious metal artifact. It is rare because it was one of the few French objets d'art that survived the French Revolution precisely because it was on Malta. It was donated to the Grotto of St. Paul by Grand Master Olof de Winyacur when the knights were entrusted with its upkeep. It carries lucid enamels once again, and it has high, delicate relief decorations of vine shoots and tendrils. It has eight medallions on the knob very they, that carry chaste images of Christ and the Apostles, all in profile but Christ. And it also carries enamels on the four roundels on its base. They portray the coats of arms of Grand Master Liladam that is quartered with the arms of the order, the arms of the order itself, the crucifixion with the Virgin and Saint John the Evangelist, and Saint John the Baptist. As already mentioned, the order's first conventual church in Burgo was gutted by fire in 1532 less than two years after they settled on the islands. This must have been one of the works of art that the knights commissioned in order to replace an objet d'art that they held very dear to them that they had lost in the fire. It is a monumental painted oil on panel crucifix that today hangs in St. John's Cathedral. It is recognized as a work by Polidoro Caldara da Caravaggio 
executed possibly with one of his Messinese assistants, Stefano Giordano. The knights may have wanted their new crucifix to look as much as possible as the painted crucifix that they had lost that had been consumed by the fire. This would account for medi the medieval shape of the cross as well as the gilded background. The painted sections are essentially mannerist, revealing Polidoro's good training. He had served as chief assistant to Raphael in the Vatican Stanza, and which he completed after Raphael's death. Polidoro, who was instrumental in introducing mannerism to, to Sicily and Naples, must have come into contact with such crosses during his lengthy stay in Sicily, where he was active in Messina. It is probable that when he painted this crucifix for Malta, he exploited the Sicilian model that was omnipresent on the island. And he was also probably being compliant with the wishes of his patron, who had requested a traditional cross. This is one of Malta's greatest paintings and a great testimony of the informed artistic patronage of the Hospitaller Knights. This and other works of art and architecture that we have mentioned, alongside others that I could not con include here, account for the great artistic legacy of the early Knights period on Malta. This early Knights period certainly enriched the course of artistic patronage, although it for a time digressed from the patronage of Renaissance works of art in favor of works that were more Gothic in style. Thank you. It has been it has been cleaned and restored. Unfortunately, it's, it hasn't been studied by Maltese art historians. It has only been recognized since 1999, I believe, to be the Madonna of Filermos. It was lost in Denmark, Russia, for a while. So, it has been restored and cleaned. There are some reports on that. Mm.
the truth is that these were still foreigners who were coming to an island that was inhabited by Maltese, Maltese locals and Maltese gentry who came from all over Western Europe, French, Spain. So I, to a certain extent, the Maltese were used to these foreigners coming into the islands. We have these romantic 19th century paintings of Lila Dam arriving to Malta, being greeted in Emdina, being given ceremonially the keys to, to the city and so on. But the truth is that there was animosity between the locals and the, and the order. But then again, we have to also consider the fact that the knights brought about a certain amount of security. A lot of the Maltese countryside had been depopulated because of corsairs, attacks by the Turks, etc. And with the knights came this better uh, fortification of the islands. Uh, towers were built all over the islands and the Maltese countryside then was, was able to be inhabited even in the remotest of areas. People were living in caves, for example, because they were concealed when from out at sea. And then that's when the, the people then started to prosper. Yes, precisely. I started with the examples of Renaissance art before the Knights in Malta to show that there was artistic sophistication and that the f 1536 report by Jean Quintan was not necessarily as honest as it should have been. He was, and even the 1524 commissioner's report that Lille Adam had sent a commission to Malta in order to get an unbiased view, even that seems to have been a bit nasty towards towards the reality of what was going on. Well, as I've said, the, the Knights brought a certain amount of security to the islands, and that is when then the countryside villages started to prosper. A l there were a lot of churches that were built on the islands. Even before the Knights, there were about 360 churches by the 15th century. But after that, these churches kept on being, uh, the upkeep of these churches was, was maintained works of art were being commissioned. There were vernacular Maltese artists who were trying to emulate the, the Renaissance works of art. The Umdina Cathedral kept on being embellished. Works of art were being brought over to further enhance the late medieval cathedral. It was till then still the late medieval cathedral. What we see today is a late 17th century Lorenzo Gaffa cathedral. And you know that the Maltese resided in the countryside, but kept on residing in the palaces in Imdina and the suburb of Rabat. And that is why Imdina receives this facelift, because the Maltese were seeing Valletta being built, the new city built by gentlemen for gentlemen, the latest mannerist styles and Baroque styles. Imdina started to seem old, old, not in the good sense that we see it today, medieval being old to them was outdated. So they started giving this facelift to buildings. And uh, then there was the excuse of, a of a, an earthquake that took place in 1697. It is not true that the cathedral was really shaken, that it was, uh, there was fear of its collapse. But they used that as an, ex an excuse to demolish the late medieval cathedral in order to then commission the more extravagant Baroque cathedral 
we see today. So the, the reality is that the arrival of the Knights instigated these new commissions. The Maltese were trying to remodernize, to remodel their city in order to be on par with Valletta, one of the greatest cities built in the 16th century. Yes, Antonio de Saliba. Okay, so that's what my PhD was on, the school of Antonello da Messina. Now, Saliba is a very common surname in Lebanon and in Malta. Salib means cross. Okay, so crusader, there's a crusader element there. Um, Antonio de Saliba, his father was a, a wood carver, Giovanni de Saliba, who is recorded on Malta. So he may have been an, an, an immigrant to Sicily who was married to Antonello da Messina's sister. And he kept on traveling to Malta to get commissions for his children. He had two painter sons and a goldsmith son, so he maintained connections there. But I do not believe there is the connection. There is a Maltese connection there, but not as distant as you're thinking, perhaps. But the, there are many Salibas. Mm. Right. I don't know about that connection. It would be interesting. I will look into it, definitely. Thank you. But it has definitely has a crusader. Um, the surname has a crusader element, Salib, Saliba. That was before. Yes, before. Possibly. I wouldn't exclude that. It is, yeah, possibility. The French element in the order is known to have been very prominent, so precisely. That is, in fact, one of the churches that existed on the islands and which the knights extended. So the extension was built according to the style of the original building. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why it looks so outdated. So that's probably a 12th, 13th century church there. By interlaced, you mean interlaced motifs? Like, like, a, like a trace. Oh yes, no, not really. We don't often see that. It was quite a an elegant, sober style that was executed, that was commissioned for Malta. You're right. Yes, there were the many the many churches that there were that were in the countryside all had some kind of altarpiece or wall paintings. Some of them were Romanesque in inspiration, some of them were very vernacular, some of them were Romanesque, low Lombard Romanesque in inspiration, but executed in the in the 
late 1400s. So there was that uh, anachronism happening also in the countryside, especially in the countryside. I would say that vernacular element persisted. But yes, they all had paintings. There was also the phenomenon of clusters of churches, because these countryside churches were often used for burials. Wealthy families living in the countryside would build their own churches in order to be buried in them. Two thousand tons. That's why it was known as the Gran Caracca, the Caracca, the Caracca Santana, the Gran Caracca, the Rodi. Uh, nice, fifteen, fifteen twenty-two in Nice. It was commissioned by Liladama a year after he was elected master of the order. He didn't yet know that it would be used to carry all these treasures from Rhodes for that seven-year exile. Yes, it was in Rhodes, built in Nice, sent to Rhodes, and then wandering the Mediterranean until it reached Malta, and it was then dismantled in Malta. That's why this, there are different works of art that are believed to have been on the Gran Caracca, in Fort St. Elmo, in Malta, in St. John's Cathedral. It was, it was pulled apart by one of the later Grand Masters, and uh, the items dispersed, the objet d'art dispersed. And that's yes. Mm -hmm. They were primarily they became a naval order, so yeah. Yeah. they were initially hospitalers, but then they became very much a naval order. Of course, it was yes, it was a matter of uh, it was a statement as well. The fact that the Grand Master took over the Castellan's house. The Castellan was Maltese of Spanish origin, living, taking care of the Burgu and the Grand Harbor. He was ousted from his house. The people of Burgu displaced so that the knights could create their own auberges buildings. And then commissioning works of art. We know that Liladam, for instance, also commissioned choral books, very fine books from from France. Um, yeah, they still survive again in St. John's Museum. It was definitely a, s a symbol of power of, yeah. The grand burnt in what though? I will double check about that, but I'm quite I'm pretty sure it was yeah, dismantled and works of art do survive, such as the oval I showed you. Maybe part of it, it was huge. So much interest. Oh, yeah. So this is the one you you say is the Virgin of. No, the other one. This one. Oh, the other one, the Hodigitria. Yeah. Ah, yeah. oh, right. The, uh, this is a very well-known iconographic type. That's. Uh, in, you know, like the late medieval period in, uh, in this Which part of the date, world. Which date? Late 
16th century mm, and so much up to the then. 17th. And so late 15th would be the earliest. Yeah, yeah. As far as we know. Yeah. I mean, none of these are dated. So, uh, but the, I mean, what's interesting is I, it was a question that I had, but I preferred, you know, like not to be posted on the others. Um, do those peoples continue to acquire objects like these um, later on? I mean, after you know they settle on Malta, uh, do they have an interest in Byzantine-style icons? Oh, Byzantine. Yeah. No, not so much. 